Welcome to the Beyond the Bucket Show, a podcast centered around optimizing all lives' buckets. We all have buckets we are balancing, coaching, entrepreneurial ventures, family, passion projects, and health. Let's all take this journey together and become bucket fillers. And here's your host, Chris McSwain. Welcome back. We've got a, another fantastic guest here on the Beyond the Bucket Show. Uh, this young coach is doing really great things. I've got to see him grow from from a young boy into a into a man, and now he's a Division One basketball coach uh, at the University of San Francisco. So, Owen Brown, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Man, I'm excited to chat with you. You've got uh, so much to offer this game of basketball. You're so passionate about it. And like I said, I, I seen you when you were growing up and to be in the position that you are now, uh, I think it's just truly amazing. So I just want to commend you first and foremost before we uh, get started. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. You know, uh, it's been a while uh, from growing up playing AAU, you working me out. Uh, it's been a while, but good to be on here. So uh, for all the listeners, why don't you give a fun fact about yourself? And a fun fact could be something like uh, you've got 11 toes or something like that. But what is a fun fact that even if I knew you, I wouldn't really know? Um, fun fact, I guess. Uh, kind of a basic one, I guess, is I'm a sneakerhead. I got over 100 pairs of shoes, but one that not many people know is I came face to face with a shark when I was uh, snorkeling in the Galapagos. It was about a six foot reef shark and uh, one of the scariest moments of my life. But that's a fact that not too many people know about me. Oh, wow. How old were you when that happened? Um, I was a junior in college, so 19 or 20 at the time, um, oh. doing a, a semester abroad there and got the opportunity to go to the Galapagos, was on a snorkeling tour and it was pretty murky and just came right up to a pretty big reef shark and, uh, you know, swam away as fast as I could, got back to my canoe and uh, took off out of there. So what was your thought process when you saw that and like what was going through your mind? First off, kind of just like, oh shit, panic mode. Right. Uh, get away as fast as I can. But then once <laughs> I got back to my uh, my canoe and was able to sit with it for a second I kind of thought to myself that's one of the coolest moments that I've ever had honestly um so it might be a little bit weird to hear that but honestly I'm I'm a big animal guy and so seeing that was a really cool experience for me wow the panic had kind of gone away Whew. uh my wife is extremely terrified of sharks and uh, we were dating and we went to Hawaii one time and we decided they have all these excursions you could do so we decided to do like a night swim with the manta ray and they kind of like swim around you and you can touch them and that sort of thing but it's pitch black and we didn't know how far they go off the coast so we start going on this boat and she gets motion sick real easy anyway so that was one thing and then we get off the boat and there's you know 25 of us and then there's two two guides that kind of lead you throughout the whole thing and they tell you where to go and kind of like follow each other and follow this rope well we get down there and you know we're out in the it's like nighttime and the only light that you can see is the lights from the uh from the tour guides they have big flashlights and then they the, like the the board that we were holding has lights so you can see the manta ray and they come up and and hang out with you but my wife was not having a really good time while that was happening and so uh she was getting motion sick while we're hanging on this board yeah. hanging on this board and she wanted to go back so the boat was probably like a hundred well I think it's 100 yards, but it might have been like 25 yards or even 50 yards. But uh, so she's like, all right, let's go back. So I tell the guy, I'm like, all right, we got to go. We got to go. And my wife is sick. And he's like, OK, follow me. And he's like a real good swimmer. And you got fins on and you got your snorkel on. But like I tried to stay right on his fins, his <laughs> flippers. And he was almost like kicking me in the face. But to the point where I was just trying to stay with him so much because I didn't want to get lost back to the boat. My wife was like way back there. And I'm like, come on, come on, come on. Oh, uh, and then. And finally, we got back to the boat, but that was one of those things where we didn't see a shark, but she was very, very uh, conscientious of possibly having a shark come visit us. So, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's that's our that's our ocean story. But that's the first one we've had where somebody had like a run in with the shark. So that's a pretty good one. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. It was a crazy experience for sure. Definitely. One, well, that, that makes your fun fact. So, um, why don't you give a three, three minute backstory on you, where you grew up and kind of how you got to where you're at right now? Yeah. So, um, like Chris said, my name's Owen Brown. I'm an assistant coach at the university of San Francisco with the women's basketball team. Uh, started off growing up in San Jose, California, uh, played basketball throughout my life growing up, uh, went to Archbishop Mitty High School and played on the varsity team there. Then for college, I went to the University of San Francisco, where I got my degree in history with my master's in teaching and education, uh, my teaching credentials. And then throughout my time as an undergrad at USF, I worked with the women's basketball team. Um, that's kind of where I got into college athletics, did that for four or five years. And then when I graduated, they had an opening uh, for an assistant coach position. So I applied, uh, got hired, and I'm going on to my uh, fourth year now coaching with them. Yeah. So tell me about that process. And, you know, because I believe you were a manager and you played you know, with the girls and practice with them. So what was that like for you? Uh, Cause you didn't play college basketball, but you had a very good basketball mind from your high school days and all the great coaches that you've had growing up. So what was that like transitioning to not necessarily being on the team, but practicing with the team while you were, uh, while you were in college? Yeah. So I was a practice player with the team which means um, there's a group of normally with women's teams, there's a group of guys that will come out and practice with the team, help them do workouts, uh, just be extra bodies at practice. So that's how I started with the team. Um, and then as I grew through that, uh, became a manager and was uh, a little bit more involved with some of that. But playing with the girls and being around it every day was something that really like hooked me on college basketball specifically, because I think, I'd always known I wanted to get into coaching at some level, um, even from high school and before, but getting that experience to see the college level team stay around high level basketball, um, be able to travel here and there with the team, um, watch them grow from practice to the games and being the, being the crowd watching that and ultimately onto the bench, you know, that's something that, really kept me excited about that energy and that atmosphere of being around college sports. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I've always, like I said, thought about getting into coaching, but my original path was to get my teaching credential, become a high school teacher, coach high school basketball, and then kind of see what would happen from there. But um, I have to say after my experience at USF, I kind of knew I wanted to redirect and try and get into college athletics. For sure. And I think you I think you did it right. And so for those that are trying to get into college uh, coaching, I think you have to identify it early. So for somebody like me, I get a lot of questions from, you know, peers and things like that. Hey, do you ever want to coach college? And I'm like, well, I'm very ancient when it comes to coaching college because I've been coaching for 20 years or so. And, you know, I'm 40 years old now. So for me to to, to go and coach college it would be very difficult because, you know, now I have a family and stuff like that. I think you did it perfectly, which is go get in the system and start being a practice player. By the way, um, you know, sidebar, how good are the girls when you were in college and you were in shape and, and still going against these high level players? Because I think there's a misnomer that girls are not as good as the guys. And I know firsthand since I've coached girls basketball for a long time, the high school players are really good and the college players are really, really good. And the average person that thinks they can compete with a division one level or any level college player, I think uh, they have another thing coming if they ever got to see them on the court. So before I continue with my question, why don't you answer how good these girls actually are when they are playing against you in practice? Oh, for sure. No, they're, they're legit, you know, um, we still have practice players that will come and work out with us. And, you know, a lot of them do come into it kind of having something in their head about what the experience is going to be like. And, you know, they get humbled real quick and, uh, you know, I still try and play with them as much as I can these days, but, um, they're, you know, very high level athletes, you know, it takes a lot to do what they do. And, you know, the, 
the level of play is really high. So anyone that is thinking, you know, they can just come in there and hang with our team or with division one college athletics, re- rethink that. Yeah. <laughs> rethink that real quick. Cause these girls are legit. And how long did it take you to actually finally get a paycheck from doing all of this? You know, you were a practice player and then you're a volunteer assistant and and just kind of made your way in. So for those that are trying to get to the level that you're at, what is it like as far as the financial sacrifice goes? Yeah, you know, so throughout my time um, in college, I wasn't paid for anything. And then... I did a volunteer year for my first year officially on staff coaching. And then my that summer going into my second year is when I got officially um, put on payroll. So it took me, I mean, you know, I started my end of my freshman year. So it was five, five full years until I was put on payroll. Yeah. And that's, and that's pretty quick because you put a lot of, a lot of time, energy and effort. I mean, when I first started coaching, whether it be on the JV basketball level um, or even when we started top flight, it wasn't like there was a lot of money coming in and we just kind of did it for the love. And the good thing is you did it for the love in the beginning, not expecting anything and you just did a good job. And then you were able to put yourself in a position where you were marketable to actually receive a job if there was one open. And I I did kind of the same thing too. And just for many, many years, you just do it for low level or, or, or whatever the case may be. And then you start to see the benefits later on. So many times young people will stop when it gets really, really difficult. And when it gets, when it's starting to get feel really uncomfortable, where it's like, I got to make a decision here or this, I'm either going to go pursue this or I got to go all in with this. And a lot of times people are approached with that, uh, that conclusion in their head and you have to, you have to really go for it. So those that are really looking to get into this, understand that you got to do it for the love in the very beginning where you're getting little to no wages. And then eventually you'll get to where you want to get to, but you have to keep taking steps forward towards that. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's all about, for me, I identified this was something that I was passionate about and that I thought I could do a really good job with and something that I could see myself doing as a career. And so, you know, I was willing to put in that time and effort and make some sacrifices, but uh, for anybody that is interested in getting into um, college coaching, you know, there's going to be some bumps along the way, but it's just part of the process. And I think it's something that if you're committed to it and you know that this is what you want to do, the reward at the end is totally worth it. Yeah. What would you say that somebody that didn't take your path, but let's just say they want to get into college coaching and they're young into their career, what would they need to do to put them in a, in a position where they can be attractive enough to receive a job opportunity later on? Yeah. Um, one of the biggest things for me has just been be a sponge, be willing and ready to learn anything and everything. And a lot of it is not just the X's and O's basketball stuff on the court that you think of. Um, There's so much that comes with college coaching that is the behind the scenes where I think a lot of people don't necessarily know about that to where, you know, you got to be good with scouting reports, cutting film, being able to help organize class schedules, being able to fundraise if necessary, being able to interact with donors and fans and your administration. And there's just so many things on that list that for me, I, I didn't necessarily know all, all about either when I was getting involved with it. Um, but as I grew and continued to work with the program, those were things that I just wanted to keep adding to my toolbox and basically making myself a more well-rounded coach, more well-rounded Uh, person and better able to help our team and our players. For sure. And so if I was a, if I was a a young coach, what would I do? Would I email everybody in the staff trying to get an opportunity? Would I reach out to my Rolodex of people that I might know and asking them what would be your best practices for trying to get in the door? Yeah, I think, um, you know, connections are kind of everything with when it comes to, uh, college coaching, it seems like. So 
you know, anybody that you know that is involved in coaching or has a connection somewhere would be a good place to reach out. Um, honestly, cold calling, emailing coaching staffs uh, to see if they have openings or if you see something pop up, going ahead and applying, just getting your foot in the door that way. And then if you do get the opportunity, if somebody does reach back out and contact you, you better be ready um, with kind of your arsenal of all the things that you can bring to a program. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, the connections is a big thing. And so, uh, you know, the things that I would say is there's been coaches that have just DM'd me and they're, uh, they're one of them is on my staff right now. And she DM'd me a few years back, hey, I want to get into coaching. And this was basically like a, a cold call to me uh, on Instagram. And yep. so I'd, I'd, I'd known her when she was a player and followed her from her college career. And, and now she's doing really great things and really helping us out. But um, that is one way to do it for sure. And then however you can add value, I think is very, very important. And don't really expect anything in, in between. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to say, like, if I was going to do it, I would probably say, Hey coach, um, I put together a scouting report on, on your team. And this is, I watched every single one of your games last year. Uh, this is what I provided. And you can even just kind of walk away from that. Here's what I think, blah, blah, blah. Cause then the coach is going to be like, wow, what's this person's story? Uh, or you can say, if there's anything else that you need, I would love to provide it. That gives them an opportunity to get to know you. You've provided some sort of value because their coach definitely knows who their team is, but who really went through the, through the process of actually put to, putting together a scouting report, watching every single one of our games in conference and this detailed thing. So I think there's a lot of things that you can do on there. I think um, utilizing Twitter would be a great thing. There's a lot of the basketball Twitter, I think, is just extremely robust. You can basically follow and get to anybody and you can tag anybody and stuff like that. So I think that's a that's a great thing. Anything else that you could think of? Um, no, just to build off of what you were saying, I guess. Um, yeah, just sometimes you might not get responses right off the bat, but if you go ahead and watch a uh, whole team's conference season and you cut film and you make a little tape of what you think X player could be doing better or what a scouting report could look like and just send it to a coach, you know, they might not respond right away, but for the most part, they will see that. And then you can stay in the back of their mind and then opening pops up on their staff. They've seen you before. They know about you. Connection can build like that. So I guess one thing I would say is don't always expect a response. Sure. Don't get discouraged by that either to not uh, hearing back from somebody that you reach out to. But if you have put in the work and have made a nice product for them to look at or something like that, that's something that's going to be on their radar. For sure. And the coaches are busy and they have a lot of people calling and a lot of people texting and a lot of people emailing. So, you know, there's priority list. Obviously their first priority is going to be their family, but right after that is going to be their current players and then recruits. Same thing with the staff, the administration, you know, all the donors and people that are around the program. So when they get a cold email from somebody, um, that's kind of difficult. Or you can ask if somebody knows somebody. So if I know that you know the coach at XYZ school, I'm going to say, hey, OB, can you plug me with so-and-so, introduce me? That's how kind of this podcast continues to grow. It's like, hey, I asked for guests. At the end, I'm going to ask you for who should come on the show and, and hopefully you'll be able to get that contact. And then yeah. from that contact, you know, we get to blossom a relationship and we just kind of move on and go from there. So I think the biggest thing to take away from that, from anybody that's listening is the relationships really do matter. Being genuine really does matter and doing a very good job at whatever it is that you're doing, providing value is really paramount to getting any type of position that you want. Yeah. Definitely. With with the relationships, just to finish off on that, you know, you never know who's going to come back around and be in your life, who's going to have opportunity that you might be interested in. So, you know, whatever level you are at, high school, division two, division one, JC, you know, anything like that, anyone who you have an interaction with, you know, don't close off any doors, keep everything open because you never know where it's going to lead to in the end. For sure. And that goes for like recruits too. If if you close the door on a coach, 
you never know what's going to happen later on. That coach could be at a different school. That that coach uh, may know somebody else that gets you a job opportunity or a playing opportunity somewhere else. So definitely mm-hmm. great point as well. Um, so you just finished your first full year of recruiting and going going around the gym to gym in the summer and it's hot and, you know, you get to wear your polos on the baseline and, and just kind of be in the mix of basketball and you're just watching basketball for – three, four or five straight days. Uh, Tell me about your recruiting experience this year. What are some of the things that you found out while you were recruiting? Because this was your first real time to actually be out there on the circuit. Um, I mean, I, I loved it. Honestly, my, my kind of in my DNA is just to sit in a gym and watch game after game after game. I love to spend my whole whole day, whole weekends in gyms, watching games, evaluating players, stuff like that. So from that perspective, I felt right at home. Um, and that was something that, um, you know, I would do in my free time anyways, if I could. So I think that was a great experience. But then other than that was just the networking and getting to meet all the different coaches and just talk basketball on the sidelines and get different opinions on certain players, certain teams, how things are being done at different schools, um, Mm -hmm. all that type of stuff um, is just super valuable and little things that you pick up along the way. Um, And so I would say those were probably my two favorite parts of going out on the road. Um, But in in regards to the play, you know, um, there's so much high level basketball being played um, across the country. And I got, a good opportunity to kind of see some of the more West coast tournaments this year. And, you know, it just makes me excited really for where women's basketball is going. And, you know, I feel like it's taken a lot of big steps in the last couple of years, especially, you know, this last year with uh, Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese kind of being, um, you know, vocal leaders for women's basketball, women's college basketball, and the show that they put on in the final four this year, when you go out to these tournaments, you can kind of feel the energy in the gym too, that women's basketball is going in a very good direction and it's just exciting to be around. No, I, um, I second your comments as well. The women's game has just really blossomed over the last, I would say since I've started coaching women 10 years ago, the skill level is at an all time high, the shooting, the size of each one of these girls too, the size of, all these high level programs is ridiculous. Even at a mid major level too, uh, even in your conference, the girls are just so tall and so skilled. And so, you know, like a a six foot point guard is, is pretty easy to find now at the division one level. And that's basically like the men's and the average height in the NBA is six feet, seven inches tall. And the average height in the WNBA is about six feet. But Sabrina Inescu is six six feet tall. So she's like a six seven point guard. Yeah. Right. And it's just crazy. Or a Haley Jones is who's six foot two and p- brings the basketball up. She's really like a six nine power guard, like yeah. a, like a LeBron or something like that. You don't really understand how good and how skilled these girls are unless you actually get get to watch a game up close and personal and just kind of know the skill level. So I definitely agree with that. And I'm just really excited to see that woman's game grow for a long time. It was kind of the, you know, stepchild of the men's game, but I see the NBA players supporting, even the college players supporting. And, and I just think it's a really great generation for women's basketball. Yeah, definitely. Um, Like I was saying, you know, just the talent is off the charts and I think, separating you can you can see the separation starting to happen it's not just i feel like in the past the wnba has kind of been like you said the stepbrother stepsister of the nba but you can see it's taking its own path now and it's becoming its own brand same with women's college basketball the game is just growing so so much and it's uh it's been great to be a part of and see Sure. So when you're recruiting, obviously everybody's at the same game watching the same players. So how do you guys stand out as a program and as a staff when it comes to recruiting some of these high level athletes? Um, When we go out recruiting, you know, uh, our green, first of all, stands out a lot. (laughs) Just our, uh, our green and gold 
So that's something we got going for us. But, you know, we love to, uh, to pitch the family atmosphere that we have at USF. And we have uh, a great, great group of girls that every year in and out, every new player always says they just feel so at home with, uh, with our group. And then another big thing that we like to focus on is being in San Francisco and all the opportunity that does come with that, you know? Sure. So at some point, everybody's career is going to come to an end. And at USF, we offer so many connections to local businesses, social media, um, connecting with, you know, really anybody from any field, San Francisco has a hub for it. And so that is one of our big selling points is, most students get the opportunity to have internships when they're at USF and mm. you get form connections. And even if you want to go play pro continue your career after USF, you always have those connections to fall back on. No doubt. And also when you're recruiting, what are you looking for in a player other than they got good size, good athleticism and, and can shoot it? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, there's always the boxes that everybody thinks of, like you said, but you know, work ethic, attitude on the court, how you are with your teammates, um, how you respond to things when they go badly, all those kind of uh, intangibles. Are you a leader? Do you vocally lead your team? Do you lead through other avenues? Um, do you pick your teammates up? Are you coachable? All those type of little intangible things are really what we're looking for because like you said, you go watch a game and if there's 20 college coaches on the baseline, it's likely they're looking at one or two players. So what do you do that stands out during those games that can put you on coaches' radars? So let's say I go to a game to watch number three play and she's doing her thing, she's balling out, but you notice number five is over there and she's the real leader of the team and she's the one that's hyping up number three and she's the one – getting the offense set and doing all the little things that you need in a college athlete, then, you know, I'll put some tabs on you and we can keep that in mind, go watch you again and again and see if that continues. And then that's when you start reaching out, talking to coaches, seeing how everything's going, what the deal is. But um, I think everyone kind of has the misconception of, Oh, if you can score 20 points a game, you know, you're going to go D one that's not the case at all. We're looking for the people that are making all the hustle plays. Are you a good rebounder? Do you box out? Do you do the little things on defense? Can you take a charge? Are you, like I said, a leader? Will you boost your team on the court? Or are you more focused on, this is my show. I'm going to go out here and score 25 points and try and get all these looks. For sure. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Obviously, if you can score 20, that's a benefit. But if you can also do all those other things, too, that's a huge, 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 you know, factor when you guys are looking at that sort of stuff. And mm -hmm. sounds like you're just looking for a well-rounded basketball player that can that can really play both sides of the floor. And I always tell our players, like, basketball, 50% of it is defense. Yeah. So if you can't play any defense, you definitely can't be on the floor now. I can, if you can just try hard, even if yeah. you're not the best athlete, but you can do some things offensively, great. Um, but at least you're putting yourself in a position that you can help the team and you're not hurting us, where you're not taking bad shots. And if you do get an open shot, it's going to be a good shot for you and, and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. um, what are some like, uh, what are some things that are red flags for you when you are watching these kids play? whether that be them on the court or the people that are around them, parents and, and, yeah. and, and you know, family members. Yeah. Um, I mean, a red flag right away can be parents who are uh, too, too involved. Let's say, um, you know, if you've, you want to have the ability, of course, it's great to have your parents and family supporting and cheering for you. But if they're trying to, do too much from the sideline or being a negative influence in the game, that can honestly be a red flag, regardless of how good you are as a player. Um, from a player's perspective, though, you know, I think the attitude is a big one. Do you hang your head if you miss a shot, make a turnover? Are you coachable? 
if you're not, you know, that's a big one too. Cause the, I, I would say that at the end of the day, the two biggest things we're looking for outside of obviously talent is energy, effort, coachability. Can you do those three things? Do you bring good energy every day to practice? Can you give a hundred percent effort even on the unglamorous defensive end or whenever we're going through conditioning, putting you through the difficult stuff? And then can you be coachable? Will you be someone who will, you know, listen to coaches, be able to accept some faults in your own game and be able to change and work on that? Those types of things would definitely be uh, red flags if you're not showing any of those. For sure. Uh, talk about offers and how that works for you guys. When do you guys decide to offer a player? How often do you want to see them? Um, do you have the autonomy at this point in your career to offer a player or do you need the head coach or the assistant coaches to all sign off on it? What is your guys' process? Yeah, so – this, like we mentioned in the beginning, this was my first summer going out. So I have not actually been involved too much in the offering process uh, with our team. I know normally, though, we will look at a player um, multiple times, try and get out to as many tournaments as we can if it's somebody that we're really interested in. And then, you know, that's a conversation between the assistant coaches and then ultimately goes up to the head coach and it's going to be uh, their decision at the end of the day. But it's something that we like to check a lot of boxes on, make sure we've talked to the players, seen them play, talked to coaches, reached out to you know anybody around them who might know the player. So that could be even uh, friends and family that we have connections with, something like that. And then after we've seen all the tape, we like to bring people on to do a visit. And you know the visits, will be a couple days coming, seeing campus, meeting with the team a little bit. And then after all of that, if everything seems good and it's somebody that we're interested in, we want to offer, then um, our head coach will go ahead and put out the offer. Right. So you see, uh, especially on Twitter, all these kids that are getting offers or posting that they're getting these offers. Uh, do you, what are you, what are your thoughts about all of that? Because some of them, if you actually call the the real coaching staff, uh, they're not really offered. They may have been, they may have talked to the coach or yeah. or something like that. They may have insinuated if you keep on participating and doing well, we will offer you in the future if you do these things. We will. So why don't you kind of talk about that? Because that's like a sticky topic that I think a lot of people. Uh, want to know about from your coach from a division one coach's perspective? Um, I think there's obviously just a big difference between, you know, having interactions with a team or a player and then actually getting that offer, you know, um, there's always going to be times you go, you watch a tournament, you watch a game and somebody's going to stand out to you. Maybe you're interested and you want to reach out and you start talking and you get a little back and forth going I feel like sometimes it can be taken as players think that that's an offer that a, a team is interested where the coaching staff or the school is thinking something completely different. So um, I think, you know, posting all of your offers is as a player personally, I think it's fine to do, you know, it's, gets your name out there even more if you are looking for something different. But at the same time, I think it's important to be careful on posting an offer when you haven't necessarily received it because, you know, coaching is a pretty tight knit circle and everybody does know everybody. So with a phone call, you can get the real information from somebody else, or it's pretty easy for, let's say, my staff at USF to pick up the phone and call so-and-so and and say, Hey, did you really offer these guys? And they're like, Oh no, no, no. We, you know, just been talking for a couple of weeks. And I feel like that's kind of a bad look if it gets, gets to that point. So has anybody like claimed they had an offer from USF and they really didn't? Um, No, not, not in my experience though. We haven't had that situation. How would you guys handle that if that did happen? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest, that would, uh, <laughs> that would be a new one. So we'd probably have to um, figure out. 
Tell Twitter to take it down. <laughs> tell, yeah. tell Elon you got to yeah, take that yeah, down. Elon and say <laughs> false information. Yeah. Well, now, yeah, it's going to be on X because they're rebranding or whatever. So that, that's what I hear. Can't call it Twitter anymore. But uh, are, are they still in San Francisco or no? Are they moved too? Uh, I'm not sure. Actually, there there were talks that they were moving out. So I'm not sure if that's happened yet or not. Yeah, the uh, the whole offer thing is like really interesting. And like, how many how many kids are you guys are on your board? Let's just say you have three spots opened up for the twenty four class. How many kids are on that board? And let's just say you have one at each position. You got one point. You got one wing and one forward slash center. But we all know everybody's a guard anyway. So. Um, yep. What uh, what are you guys? How many kids are on that board? If you got three spots, um, I think I'd probably say there is around around ten. But you kind of have different tiers. I would, I guess. So, you know, you've got the ones that you you really want, and if you could get those three, that would be your one, two, three, easy. And then you've got a couple that you know you're talking to because you're not sure if you could get the top ones and. It, it gets really uh, – it gets a little complicated as you get into it because there's so many schools a lot of times that are reaching out and communicating with these people. So you could have a conversation and feel like you're in a great spot with somebody and that they're super ready to go, all USF, and then, you know, they call the next school and then they're all feeling that one. So it's a constantly changing um, system, but I think for the most part, you know, you probably have – a handful of people that you're interested and then you got your top front runners and uh, kind of go from there. How much did COVID affect recruiting? Um, I think there's still like three years left. So everybody got an extra COVID year. So let's just say you were a freshman mm -hmm. and you redshirted that year, but then you also have your COVID year and then you get four years to play too. So that's six years. And that's a lot of kids that, uh, that have taken that COVID year and they're continuing to play. And then, you know, a lot of them have got their undergraduate degree and then they go and be a grad transfer and things like that. How did that really affect recruiting uh, in the landscape that you guys are dealing with now? Well, yeah, I think in conjunction with that, the transfer portal boomed right at the COVID, um, right at the time that COVID was hitting. So you know, everyone's getting an extra year. Grad transfers don't have to sit out a year. So I feel like for a lot of teams, the transfer portal has become really the main place that coaches are looking to get new players. Um, you know, I, th I think it's really hurt freshmen and sophomores in these last couple of classes coming in because they're not necessarily getting the looks because if you have a couple spots to fill, why would you not go look at somebody who's averaged 10 points a game at the division one college level and proven themselves that they can play at this level versus taking what is more of a gamble on a high school player who maybe they prove that they should be able to play at that level, but haven't proven it against division one competition might have to take a year or two to get to that level because they are 17, 18 years old coming out of high school. When you have the opportunity to go get a 21 year old who's ready to plug in and play and still has two more years left. So yeah, it, it's been interesting with, with the whole extended eligibility with COVID. Yep. And at the same time, you know, that first year, a lot of schools had people that were signed into their next incoming freshman class when their seniors wanted to come come back and play that fifth year. Right. That, that was a tough situation for a lot of people to handle as well. Yeah, it is tough. And uh, I deal with it when I'm working with our players yeah. that want to continue to play on at the next level. And if you would have said five years ago, Hey, you know, I want to play in college well, the landscape has really changed, like you already mentioned. Mm -hmm. So it makes total sense. Why would you not take somebody that is proven? It just makes yeah. sense. It is like, it's like one plus one equals two. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, for college coaches, they may not have four years to really develop somebody. 
Mm-hmm. You may not have that opportunity. And if you're if you're a top 50 type of kid or even a top 100 kid, you're going to be fine. Yeah. But for, for most people, that is not the case. You are not going to be 100, 150, even 300. And so there's only a limited amount of scholarships available. And I would rather just give this scholarship to somebody that I only – I can have them for two years. And then if I want to go get an, a freshman in two years, fine. But I got this kid as two more years left over. I'm going to take this kid. And it uh, it does suck for high school kids. And so high school kids need to understand that. And so don't, don't underestimate any type of interest that you get, whether that be at the division two or division three level, still high level basketball or the NAIA level. It's still high level basketball. The only difference between the levels are going to be the size and athleticism at your at your level is going to be much different than a division two. But there are some division twos that can really compete, and division twos beat division ones a lot of the time in the preseason when they schedule them for the exhibitions and things like that because it's really not that big of a difference. Yeah, how would you say uh, from your perspective as a high school coach, how has that affected uh, your players or? people that you train with for a top flight, things like that? I think this, it has to, you have to temper the expectations. And one of the things uh, that, that I talked to my friend about, he coaches the boys um, in every, in every other field, we look at numbers and there's just not enough spots for the amount of people that want them. Mm-hmm. And we we look at numbers in, in real estate. Oh, this house is worth this. This house is worth that. And that's basically what, what it is. You are, you're basically real estate. And so if I'm a top, uh, a power five type of kid, I got, I can go anywhere I want. So I can buy any house that I want or choose any house or any suitor that you want. Um, but the kids that are not at that level, well, you're going to have to wait till somebody chooses you. And more importantly, you're going to have to really market yourself to put yourself out there. So I just think you have to temper the expectations of what this actually is. If it's not a kid that is going to be a, a, a bona fide power five kid, when you're looking at the mid-major level, there's going to be a lot of kids that kind of fit in this box. Mm-hmm. And like you said, you're only looking at you know, 12, 10 to 12 kids per year and they need to fit this one thing. So if you're a point guard and there's a six foot point guard and you're a five foot five point guard, well, we already know what's going to happen if it's even, unless the five foot five player is exceptional. And even if you are exceptional, you're always going to take the size over the uh, you know, over the shorter person. You're just always going to do it. Like if I was going, Steph is my favorite player. And I think he's one of your favorite players too, yeah. but, and I personally wouldn't, wouldn't do this, but most people are going to take KD and I actually probably would get KD mm-hmm. if it was just like, Hey, we're going out to the park and we want to win every single game. Yeah. I'm probably going to take the size because he can do more things, even though Steph is incredible in like for a game or even a series, he can probably win that. But just the more consistency, you're going to, it's going to go with the size because you can do more things. Um, so I just think that that's very important and we have to look at the numbers. We have to understand that there's just not enough spots for the people that want to take them. And you have to really put yourself out there and be okay with going. If you, And by the way, if you can get to college at any level and play and get it paid for, yep. you, have, you have done something that 99% people don't get to a cup or 99, 90, I think it's 98% of high school kids don't get the chance to do. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the most important thing. So when you're, and this is speaking to parents, if you have a child that has aspirations to play in college, it really doesn't matter what level it is. It can be any of the levels that I mentioned, those four levels, just ha- give them the opportunity to do that. Um, and I think that's going to be the most important part and just not, just not, you know, downgrading a level because it's D2 or D3 and I, it doesn't have to be D1. You just want to play and have fun and get your education. Those are, that's a win, win, win. Yep. And then, I mean, just a little wrap up on that is, you know, like I said earlier, always keep your options open because you never know what's going to happen with the transfer portal being so active and so many people changing schools. You know, if you 
do you take something at a division two and you have a great couple of years and somebody that you had talked to from division one is interested again or new opportunities come up, then you maybe have opportunities to change levels or switch schools. So, you know, don't, don't take any opportunities for granted for sure. Yeah. Um, so your staff has been there. I think your head coach has been there. This is her seventh season now. Uh, yes. I'm going into her eighth, I believe. Going into the eighth. So how do you like working for coach and um, what have you learned uh, in your time there playing as a practice player and then moving on to the staff? Yeah. You know, I've, I've loved working with this staff. It's been pretty consistent for my entire time since being at USF really. So I, got to really grow up myself as a coach under our current staff. And so that's been great, you know, being able to go from a practice player um, to more responsibilities in the program to finally, you know, being on staff. Um, I think I've learned so much um, in this experience Uh, being put in situations that, you know, like I said in the beginning, I didn't necessarily know all the behind the scenes that come with college coaching. You know, a lot of people think you're going to coach basketball, like X's and O's, like what workouts do you do, all this stuff. But there's so much more that comes with it. And I've been able to learn a lot that I can take with me throughout my career um, through these last eight years with the staff. And uh, where do you want to take your career? Do you eventually want to be a head coach and uh, run your own program? Um, you know, what are your goals with coaching? Yeah, ultimately, you know, I head coach someday is the ultimate goal, you know, um, at the division one level. But at the same time, I'm someone who always likes to keep it in perspective where I would never close myself off from any opportunities and see where basketball takes me. You know, I've been blessed to have a career in basketball and in coaching where it's something new every day. It's different challenges. It's a fun atmosphere. You get to be around high level athletes and competition. And so, you know, I'm I have my ultimate goals at the end of the day, which I think, you know, wanting to be a head coach at the division one level is definitely the ultimate goal. But who knows what might come up along the way? And I don't ever want to really close myself off to any of that either. Yeah. And you, the good news is you started in your profession very young and getting to the highest level collegiately uh, at a young age. So you're going to have a lot of opportunities as you continue to grow. And you've mentioned it before, just you were, you've been a sponge your entire career, whether it be playing um and then, you know, soaking that in and then going directly and helping out. Uh, what do you mostly do in your skill development stuff uh, for for the team? Because I know that's a high priority of your program and one of your job titles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, really, I do a lot of the individual workouts with players, um, you know, helping every day, instruct different parts of practice, um, pretty much. I always like to approach it when I'm working out with a player of having things in mind of what I believe they need to work on and what can help us in practice. But also I like to make it collaborative. What do you think you need to improve on? Is there anything you'd like me to work into today to into today's workout stuff like that? So, you know, I think I have a better handle on the guard workouts, of course, being that I was a guard growing up and playing, um, However, I've learned so much about coaching posts as well that I'm becoming a lot more comfortable being able to lead those workouts as well. Um, But the biggest thing for me, I think, is being able to have a collaborative workout session where they're free to ask questions. Oh, why are we doing this? How come you want me to, for example, use a ball screen this way? And what am I looking for? And all those types of questions that I feel like sometimes players don't necessarily get to ask you kind of go into a workout and I have to do this, this, and this, but I love the approach of working out with the why available and like, how is this going to translate to a game? How is this going to help me out? So I'd say that's probably one of the biggest things I like to focus on with my workouts. And then, like I said, I do a lot of the stuff with, um, with our guards. 
Yeah, I, I like that. And so what are the four things that you would tell coaches and players that they need to have if they want to play at your level? So in these workouts that they're doing, because everybody works out and everybody has a trainer, what are four things that you would like to be really good for them to have the opportunity to play at your level? Um, first one, I'd say play under control and be smart with the ball. You know. Okay. So break that down for me. Does that mean finishing off of two, into the lane off of two, off a stride step? What are you guys really focusing on? Because that's what that's what I think about when I say when you're saying playing under control. It's like when you get into the lane and you don't have a finishing solution, I have something to make sure that I can get an extra second. Uh, I can pivot. I can get around and to either create a shot or, uh, you know, create a shot for myself or my teammate. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, attacking the rim, be able to finish off of two. Don't put yourself in situations where you are off balance and can't make a play jump passing is a big one um dribbling too much to where you're in situations where you get stuck with the ball um being able to just be under control and not try to do too much as a player know what your habits are and be able to do those to the highest ability so that will also include limited dribbles be able to do everything you can between one two and three dribbles yep Yep. Okay. And then know who you are as a player. If you're somebody that's great with the ball and can do all of that, by all means. But if you're somebody who is more of a shooter and starts trying to do too much, put it on the floor, do all this, then you're going to get in trouble at the D1 level for sure. Good. Okay. Number two. Number two, I would say shooting. Got to be able to shoot the ball, even uh, as a post these days. You know, everybody's stretching the floor, um, fours and fives six foot two, six foot three players are able to hit the three now. So, you know, even if three point shooting isn't necessarily your strong suit, have the ability to make somebody guard you from out there. Um, I feel like in the NBA, you see it a lot, you know, with Russell Westbrook or with Draymond, people are just sitting back in the paint and daring you to shoot. And at that point you can't do anything with it. So At our level, too, we don't have the three in the key or anything like that, the defensive three seconds. So if you're not a threat with the ball, players can sag off of you, and then you kind of become a liability offensively. Love that. So under control, being able to shoot, what's number three? Number three, I'd say, is defense. You know, bottom line, to get on the court, you need to be able to guard something. So we've – I've seen players in the past that might have the craftiest offensive game ever, but if you score 20 on one end and give up 30 on the other, you're not going to be able to get on the floor. Um, And speak to to the fact that it's not just on the ball either. It can be your off ball defense, which gives up, you know, points and it may not be your player per se, but it, it, you did affect that position, that possession for them to go and get a basket. Definitely. I've, a lot of people would uh, think on ball defense first, but definitely um, are you in your right gaps? Are you in help side? Can you take a charge when you need to? Will you rotate and communicate to where you've rotated so that everybody else knows knows what's going on around you? Those are all really important things. Definitely. And number four? Number four is uh, attitude. Attitude is one that Everybody can control themselves, but is the most important on the court, in my opinion. Um, You got to come in with a good mindset, you know, be confident in your abilities, be able to boost your teammates, be able to adjust to however the game is being called um, with the whistles, however it's going, whether you're up 10, whether you're down 10, can you be the same consistent player, have a good attitude that's going to bring that winning mentality every game? For sure. And you said something earlier, but I use something similar as energy, attitude, and effort. I think you said energy, attitude, and uh, started with a C, I believe. Coachability. Coachability, yeah. yeah. And that's and that I think that goes along with your attitude as well, you know, being coachable. Mm-hmm. Those are the things that you can control always. Um, you know, if you go into a room, you can't really control what the thermostat is. But I always tell people you're either going to be a thermostat or you're a thermometer. Either you're getting the temperature or you're going to be setting the temperature. And uh, I always want to be setting the temperature 
and hopefully it's a, a one of positivity. Hopefully it's, it's one of, you know, good energy, good effort. And I think that's very important for just really not just basketball, but any, any, any opportunity that you get. I think if you can bring those type of things, you're always going to be marketable and, yeah. and that's really what you want. Yeah, for sure. Um, that definitely translates to, you know, off the court in, in class in your job in just in life, you know, bringing good energy and an attitude, good attitude to relationships is always, always a plus. No doubt. Speaking about relationships, you just got recently engaged. So congratulations. I do. Thank uh, you. And so, so my wife was with me when I started coaching at a young age. Um, so, you know, <laughs> does your future wife understand the commitments of a basketball coach uh, in this game, especially at your level? Oh yeah, she she knows what she's getting herself into. Um, she was a Division One soccer player at USF as well, and she now works in the athletic department. So she she knows what it's about. Um, she's been super supportive and just really excited for me to be getting my career going. And uh, yeah, you know, being the partner of a coach, a college coach, can be very um, tiring, demanding. There's a lot of long, long nights, long days, travel trips, all of that stuff. But um, she's been great with everything. Well, if she gets an AD job, maybe she'll hire you as a basketball coach. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, I can <laughs> kind of push her into the admin role and uh, help me out. For sure. Um, where can everybody follow you uh, and all the things that you are doing personally as well as for the school? Um, yeah, you know, uh, follow me. I can, uh, send you my links, but it's coach Brown underscore OB for my coaching account on Instagram, uh, should be the same for Twitter as well. And then, you know, follow USF Dons women's basketball. Awesome. Before I let you go, if there is a guest that should be on the show, who should it be? And you have to make the connection. A uh, great guest, I think, to have on the show would be Arthur Marrera. He is a, uh, a new associate head coach now at University of Idaho. Okay. Had been, had been at University of San Francisco for a while, but just got done coaching with the U19 Brazilian national team. So, okay, cool. I'd love to meet Arthur. So I, ex I expect you to make a text introduction to us at some point. Yeah, <laughs> uh, sure. But I, I would love to have him on the show. Will do. All right. Well, thank you so much, Owen. Uh, man, I just can't tell you how uh, proud I am of you and, and all the things that you're doing. You've got a lot of great things ahead of you and you're just really getting started on this journey and it, you've already been doing it a while. So man, congratulations to you and everything you've been doing. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on and uh, looking forward to staying in touch. All right, my man. All right. We'll see you. Thank you for listening to the Beyond the Buckets podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and share the show with your friends. And until next time, take care.